Okay, so it's the 11th of June, 2024. Um, open Source Antibiotics, Moore Ligase meeting. Um, so the uh, thanks, Yuhan, for putting the agenda and all those action items up. I think, again, there are a few key points that we want to talk through. Um, and as is traditional, Adrian, because you've just sent through the file with all the data in it, would you be happy to go first and to talk us through what you've been doing? By all means. Right. So I just uh, share my screen. Said. Right. Can all see that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Right, so um, Yuhang's compounds are in, in the process of being done, uh, but we, we had some compounds that we have to deal with from GUI uh, targeting Mycobacterium tuberculosis murray, uh, which is really what we're going to talk about today. Um, so, I said, I just move this out of the way. Right. So I'm just going to move you all to the left. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, new enzyme, uh, which Laura has uh, kindly cloned and overexpressed and purified. Um, and as with any new target, we characterize it. Um, so, uh, in the top left hand corner, um, we have a histogram which basically shows that in the fluorescent assay that we employ, um, Mycobacterium TB Murray um, is dependent upon the expected substrates, ATP, UDP malic dipeptide, of course, the enzyme itself, and its amino acid substrate, dimalic acid. The fluorometric assay, moving to the <clears throat> right, top top row is linearly dependent upon the activity <coughs> of the enzyme, so the linearity with respect to protein. And um, using a test inhibitor, which is ADPCP, um, it shows the expected response for an ATP competitive inhibitor with an IC50 of around about 2.7 micromolar. Um, we characterize the enzymes kinetically because um, we're aware that these particular substrate uh, compounds that have been supplied are uh, directed towards the UDP substrate binding site. So we've characterized the response of the enzyme to its three substrates, determined the kinetic constants for it. And because we're working with a UDP dependent or a UDP competitive inhibitor, uh, we drop the concentration of the UDP substrate in our assays down from the, its usual 0.1 millimolar to 12.5 micromolar and kept the ATP at a sub -KM, KM concentration of 50 micromolar. So hopefully, um, as far as competition is concerned, we will be set to see whatever is there. So next next slide. So experience is taught that whenever we receive any compounds now from anywhere, we screen the coupling system first before we actually screen the target. So we took GUI's compounds and we screened them against <clears throat> the coupling system with the fluorometric assay, which is a three enzyme system, urinucleoside phosphorylase, xanthine oxidase and phosphorylase peroxidase. And essentially, with the exception of three compounds, I think, um, <clears throat> GUI's inhibitors all exerted greater than 50% inhibition of the coupling system. And we know that when that happens, you start to see um, artifacts. You'll see inhibition that you might ascribe to uh, TB Murray, but you can't do because um, if you drop the activity of the coupling enzyme concentration by 50% or more, then actually that starts to become rate limiting. And we've tested that in the past, and we know the parameters of the assay. 
under those circumstances. <clears throat> so we retested gooey compounds at 0.1 millimolar. And <clears throat> there, there are 10 compounds um, that actually were usable in the assay as, as regards to screening. So it's a problem because you lose some of the sensitivity of the assay because the inhibitor concentration drops. But within the confines of this assay, there wasn't much else that we could do. So we screened the compounds where we were confident that we would get a result that was the consequence of TB Murray activity. And we got this. So in those compounds that were usable, um, we found three compounds that gave greater than 60% inhibition of thereabouts. Um, we characterized them with respect to their IC50s. Um, if you look at the actual data, um, there's a strong degree of negative cooperativity going on. The IC50s are all uh, greater than 100, well, 100 micromolar or greater. Um, there's a lot of scatter um, in the data. Um, my gut feeling is that there is compound aggregation going on, um, or possibly the impact of compound on fluorescence. But the problem, the real problem is that we're losing a lot of chemical equity here. We're losing a large proportion of the compounds that we are actually supplied with. So uh, we adopted the other assay that we use, which is, actually I skipped a slide. <laughs> so I'm going to just let me go back for a second. One of the problems with the fluorometric assay is there are three coupling steps. And that's, if you like, three sites of uh, lability where a compound could interfere. So we modify the assay where we basically just use methylthioguanosine uh, as the PNP substrate, which itself uh, generates a chromophore, methylthioguanine. So this is a more robust spectrum photometric version of the fluorometric assay. We don't use it as much because it requires a far higher volume because it's a spectrum photometric assay. And the absorbance uh, that we use is pretty close to the absorbance of many compounds in libraries. So it's not ideal, um, and it, but it is a backup. So we tried this with GUI's compounds. Again, uh, we checked um, that the enzyme itself under these circumstances, that is to say the coupling enzyme PNP, uh, was or wasn't inhibited by uh, GUI's compounds. And in actual fact, at 0.5 millimolar, <clears throat> um, there, the assay was usable with seven compounds and at 0.1 millimolar, uh, the assay was usable with uh, virtually all the rest apart from GF65, which no matter what we did, um, gave massive interference in the assay. So with that, um, those compounds that we screened at 0.5 millimolar, nothing really happened to an extent of more than 50% inhibition at half millimolar. But GF62, sorry, beg your pardon, GF62 uh, at 0.1 millimolar gave 75% inhibition or better. So, and this compound also showed up as one of the inhibitors in the fluorometric assay. So this compound here might have, there's some longevity to it. Um, and this, we'll be doing IC50s of that. Um, and that's where we are at the moment with things. Okay, <clears throat> great, thank you. Um... I get my just my first question is about the solubility thing of using these concentrations. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you? I mean, I guess you can always see this visually, right, and see if something's cloudy or maybe aggregating. Is there a yeah. way that you can measure solubility, for example, through light scattering? Um, we probably can. Um, I 
I guess we might have an issue with sample sizes, but yes, we can, we certainly can in principle. Okay, all right. Guy, do you have any comments about the data? You're, you're muted, I think, even though you're not muted. You're unmuted on Zoom, but something else is going on. No, no good. Sorry, you still must be uh, something with a microphone or a connector or something. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a challenging system, isn't it? Um, because there's so many other possibilities here. Um, the, I, I mean, you know, in a situation like this, you might then say, well, can we try to get a the um, orthogonal assay system like SPR, things like that? Well, um, I mean, the, the one thing I am thinking is that if we do, if we still wanted to do this by enzyme activity, um, we might have to resort to bioluminescence uh, luminescence using things like um, kinase glow, which basically mm. it's an ATP depletion system. Yeah, where you basically look at the residual ATP using um, luciferase. Yeah, it's still a coupled assay. Yeah, um, in, in the sense that we might be picking up really affecting luciferase inhibitors, yeah. um, but um, it it would be the next thing we'd probably try. Yeah. Is that a because we I mean we use that quite a bit in in some of the antiviral projects and we I mean certainly been having problems there with false positives and with you know aggregation problems too. Yeah. Um, is that is it something that is relatively straightforward to run? Yes, it is. I mean we 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 do we have um, kinase assays that we do run with it in other in other projects. So it is something that we could certainly turn around. Right. I mean, what 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 I would say is that there is one compound here with the data that we've got that we can pursue. Right. I guess the, the question is, given that um, we can actually pursue the others with a kinase glow assay, um, if desired. But bear bear in mind that we we also have Yang's compounds to do and, and so sure. on. Yeah. But I know that they're waiting. Yeah. Yep. Um, just in terms of something like SPR, I mean, obviously, Laura, you did this for MERS previously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a mm -hmm. we have a GCI instrument, one of these graded coupled interferometry instruments uh, here, and and we're using that for in in other projects. Um, how? I mean, you know, comparatively, how easy is it to, I mean, I, I don't know, what, I don't know how you quantify this, but how easy is it to attach these things to a chip and do SPR um, versus other protein targets you might have done? I mean, is, is it something we could contemplate doing here, given that we have a machine here and we have some chips? Sure. Um, it will depend greatly on the protein, basically. It just depends on how the protein behaves while it's being attached and where the tag is, if the tag is good enough, that kind of thing. So yeah. we only got um, cis histidine tag, if I remember correctly, and the C terminus. Right. Um, so, you know, we can send you some protein for these uh, mu E, and you can give it a try and see if you can immobilize, immobilize it properly. But being a his tag, usually you need to do also amine coupling for sensors, because yeah. they're not actually that good, unless you use an antibody, basically a his tag antibody. Right. That's what kind of surfaces you've got. Um, I don't think I would um, do hardcore amine I mean, coupling because with the other amino I guess I mean coupling doesn't work on its own. Uh, so you need a kind of attack to attach it to the surface first and then do the coupling. Because these proteins don't like to be um, with uh, that pH, you know, a 4 pH, 4 pH, 3. They don't like it. Right. So they aggregate. Yes, I mean, I, I think, you know, the stuff we're doing at the moment has streptavidin chips. So is it, it, would it be simple to, you know, modify? I could, them? I could try to reclone them. Well, I mean, it's all about resources and time, right? But uh, Yeah, but, exactly. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm going to check how easy it would be with the, because I bought a new system. Well, I bought, no, I got a new system from the SGC, well, CMD. <laughs> all right. It sent me some new vectors. So I can have a look how quickly it would be for these particular um 
uh, a gene and um, yeah okay all right because we yeah we use the instrument quite a bit now and um it would be nice to make use of it and, and to have a, an orthogonal assay would be nice um where we have problems like this right where we, we we're faced with some challenges to do with the with the coupled system uh what worries me as well is uh, how what's the correlation between the binding and the assay right because we didn't have a great correlation in the past yep. so yeah, that would be my only worry. I don't know the system that you've got. Um, I think they've got one in Harwell as well. So we could also be running things every time I go there. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, we could try to see if we can measure in the presence and absence of the substrates and mm -hmm. cofactors and things like that. Yeah. But it will depend on how much volume we need for all these things, because that's not possible with the... S200 or T200, no, sorry, with the T200 SPI that we got, it will be possible with the S S200. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think okay. it is, yeah, it, it is worth remembering that you'll measure binding, but you won't measure impact on activity necessarily. For sure. That, yeah. That is a series of compounds of life arc, which have been selected on the basis of SPR data, none of which turned out to be inhibitory. Right, right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you can you can do some work at trying to improve the binding using a biophysical assay. And then when you've got something good, you can start going back into the biochemical assay, right? Because yeah. mm -hmm. then you're using smaller concentrations. Yeah. If we are able to use small volumes, then you can also do competition assays with the different parts of the, you know, ATP. We want to target ATP pocket, then you yep. can just compare with the ATP if you get more or less binding when the compound is there right. and is present. And that could give you an idea of, okay, the volume that I'm seeing, at least part of it, is selective to the active site pocket, because you could have a mixture of a specific and non-specific binding, especially yeah. the compounds are the gate, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, and we are also seeing the aggregation problems when trying MICs. So Jenny, she had to do a post on the MICs for um, Macobatinus mechmatis. Um, because he needed to run some um, uh, toxicity assays with human cells, so she didn't want to have both cells in the same incubator. We're getting an incubator, so we can have two different things going on. Uh, but until then, she had to do a pause on that. However, we have seen in two rounds of the experiment uh, problems with uh, solubility, and this mathematics doesn't deal very well with a lot of GMSO. So we're trying to optimize the assay, at least to get some kind of uh, data. Right. Yeah. Which compounds are you talking about there, sorry, Laura? The, um, uh, these compounds, the key compounds. These ones, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we, well, we also wanted to try the other compounds, compounds from you know the other uh, rounds, uh, Yuhan and all that. I think we did try those. I don't know if the data is uh, viable or not. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I think we yeah we did send you right the last compounds of you hunt with uh, tuberculosis. Sorry, Michael, back to you. <laughs> um, Guy, did you want to come in if you've got if you're fixed your? Oh, it's still no good, Guy. Sorry, your audio is still no good. Yeah, he can use he can use mine. So, oh yeah, the advantage yeah. of the same room. <laughs> okay. No running in the lab. <laughs> Where is the mic? Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks, uh, Adrian. Um, so I just have a question uh, about the coupling system. What does actually uh, mean that uh, the compounds are actually inhibiting the, the, uh, the coupling system? Um, so... Yeah, I, I didn't catch you properly, yeah. Okay, can I, I'll go back a few slides. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, this is an outline of the assay that we would normally use if they're a metric assay. Mm -hmm. And so, essentially, the generation of phosphate by Marie uh, as a result of its activity uh, is then used to cleave anisine to generate hyperxanthine, which is then oxidized by xanthine oxidase in two steps. That generates hydrogen peroxide. And then you can couple hydrogen peroxide generation to um, the conversion of Manflex red to a fluorophore resolution. So, 
clearly, um, it's not a direct assay of activity simply because there's no signal unless you directly couple it to something. Mm -hmm. So the question will always come, whatever you do, is do the compounds that we're talking, that you supply, for example, um, impact upon the E or do they impact upon the coupling system? So we've done a lot of work in the past to show that because the enzymes are used to construct the coupling system, are there in sufficient abundance that even if you inhibit them up to 50%, there's no loss of detectable Murray activity, although beyond that there is. Um, we know that it pays to look at the coupling system first to determine whether your compounds will actually inhibit um, the coupling system to the extent whereby we couldn't trust the data. And it turned out, unfortunately, that the normal concentrations we use of substrate for inhibitor screening, half millimolar, most of yours did. So then we had to reduce the, com the, the, com the compound concentration, retest the coupling enzymes, and found that uh, on first pass, roughly about half of them actually were assayable, which we did. Uh, and then, as I said, because we would lose a lot of your chemical equity, because we're throwing away half of your compounds, uh, we adopted a second assay um, where we've basically replaced um, three coupling enzymes with one. The problem here is that it's a spectrophotometric assay and therefore the volumes are greater by fivefold. So um, we we go through enzyme, more importantly, substrate the five five times the rate and also the absorbance which is uh, 360 is close to that where you might expect other compounds to absorb so essentially um it we tried it um and we actually did manage to see um some of the other compounds um that the fluorometric assay failed at one of which was GF62, which actually kept, uh, lit up in both assays. And in actual fact, GF62 uh, was 75% or so inhibitory at 0.1 millimolar, which is good in, in our books anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we got to. I see. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for explaining. Uh, uh, get a better understanding now. Uh, and uh, another question regarding the the previous compounds like the A double uh, seventeen or sixty seven, which is the ones that I use as starting points to design these compounds. Did you uh, uh, did you see any sort of uh, these kind of uh, uh, problems when you when you guys have testing then against the bacterial uh, enzymes? Um, we well we 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 screened those compounds mm -hmm. in, in the same way. In, in other mm -hmm. words, we established coupling enzyme sensitivity, and AW seventeen uh, et al. They 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 passed. They were fine. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, um, because I'm just I'm just asking uh, to try to identify identify which parts of the the molecule could be potentially uh, uh, having these kind of problems. So yeah. it's probably yeah the the other parts that they're just designing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, so I mean, the drug design was basically try to uh, increase the solubility of these compounds compared to the uh, the starting point, which is uh, AW17. And uh, I mean, yeah, we didn't test the solubility of none of them. The, just the uh, prediction tools, they, they showed that it could actually increase the solubility. But of course, yeah, we can see that uh, they are not enough for the for the assay apparently. So my idea, maybe I mean in terms of chemistry, uh, it's maybe uh, use uh, the this GF sixty two and uh, try to tweak the structure in order to increase the solubility. Maybe I think that's the the first idea that I I yeah. can have right now. Yeah, I mean, I I think we just we we should try and get some data on these because if you're seeing, you know, I mean, let, let's pretend we get an IC fifty here when mm -hmm. when you measure that one compound, Adrian, of you know eighty micromolar or hundred micromolar, and we find the yeah. solubility is like two micromolar, then you just can't. <laughs> right? No, exactly. 
So, mm -hmm. um, so we should try and get some data on, on a couple of these compounds to see if that's had an effect. Um, mm -hmm. And and try yeah I mean some experimental data would be good and and ideally you know compare them with the compounds that you you designed off um, gi you know mm -hmm. so that you can show that you've made an improvement but maybe mm -hmm. it's still not enough and uh, yeah yeah it's always difficult okay yeah, so we, yeah carry on Adrian sorry I guess for my part we can look into uh, seeing whether we can get a luminescent luminescent version of this thing working with a kind yeah. of type of assay system. I mean, basically, uh, it'll just increase the number of chances the compound has to mess things up. But mm -hmm. but um but the but the more the more we try, uh the more likely we are to succeed in, in getting somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. And um and Lara, if we, we can talk about SPR offline and, and see if there's something we can do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because you won't need much protein. Yeah, so. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously, thank you, Adrian, for doing all that work. Yeah, it's yeah great. thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, you and his compounds are coming. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> and we are. We are doing them. We'll be doing them against the other ligands. Okay. Cool. Great. Um. All right. If you're if you're done, then Yuhan, did you want to talk about that a little bit? Because you've been doing a bunch of analysis on on f kind of final targets that you are making and need measurements for, and, and you had a table that you were um, Adrian. If you could unshare that, yeah. Could. Did you want to just say anything about that, uh, Yuhan? Or um... oh, I've only managed to uh... let me share the screen first. Uh... I posted on GitHub uh, about uh, where we're at at the moment. Yeah, a link uh, to a sheet, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Could you just bring that up maybe and just show people what you're doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Let me, let me bring it out. Because ultimately, I'll, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll just say that uh, ultimately, Yuhang was, you know, has been trying to make these um, uh, derivatives of the AZ compounds that should accumulate better based on sort of, you know, ideas found in the Hergenrother papers. So, you know, using primary amines and, and that didn't seem to work too well. So using things like guanidinium groups and pyridinium groups to, to improve um, accumulation. And um, that's all that's all very well, but sometimes the synthesis is then very difficult. So you have to make a judgment call about whether it's worth it. And Yuhang was reading around the subject and found that it seemed as though the pyridinium compounds weren't as promising in the literature as the guanidinium compounds. So he, um, I think, is refocusing his efforts on on making sure the guanidiniums are are made um, and measured, and then once we're once we're done with that, we can sort of publish that as a study. So taking the AZ compounds with an alcohol, making the amine version, um, making the uh, guanidinium version, and and seeing if there's an improvement. Um, that's the idea. So so I think you know coming up with a short list of compounds that you you are going to make, and then we can publish that as a story. Did you want to just share the the sheet, you know? Oh, you've picked up uh, Guy's audio bug. It was muted, actually. Oh, sorry. Uh, mm. I, I I was uh, forced. Uh, I was forced to log off because uh, log out because the network. Now it's back. Okay. Let me you, share my... you can share. Yeah. Let me share the screen. Oh. Current file data. Uh, right, so this is linked on the GitHub issue, right? Yeah, so I, I prepared I, uh, in both uh, Excel and uh, yeah. uh, uh, Google Sheets form. All right, so down the left there are all the compounds that you've been making that are variants of the AZ compounds. Yeah. And you've included the AZ compounds themselves, right, that you resynthesized? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh... yeah, and then there's the amine, row number eight. Yeah. And then other derivatives that you've made, which are intended to do the same thing, primary amines, yeah. and then guanidiniums. Yeah, the red ones are uh, are in progress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, the uh, idea here is to show that the des you know the design leads to compounds that inhibit, um, and then you know in an ideal world, one of these would have uh, some slightly measurable MIC because it accumulates better. But that's the point of the study. Um, 
the one just uh the one compound i don't see there though yuheng was the one with just with the amine directly attached so just yeah, where yeah. the southwest group is nh2 yeah this one no no get rid of the ring get rid of the fennel ring and the chain oh so, that one that one happened i haven't uh figured out a way to make it at the moment so okay oh you All want right. you want a direct aiming yeah because yeah. they're not uh hydrogen cylinder hasn't been set up so yeah it's coming you're... oh okay yeah so you can do it but i think you should yeah. try and try that one in there too yeah okay um uh, yeah so is there anything from the sheet are... assembling all the data here is there anything you know in terms of the sheet that you would just want to flag up as obviously missing that we're going to need uh at the moment uh, i think i think one thing is the accumulation data you yep. want to find collaborators yeah uh that have to make all these uh compounds again to to prepare for that accumulation assay uh for some other data i think we are do we still have to get some uh get the ic50 data oh that, that's not necessary uh I think we pro I probably want to resynthesize this aiming uh, using another method using using coupling, okay. uh, and uh, if that works, then we probably want to have the IC50 data as well, because that was my first aiming compound. I didn't know how to properly prepare that, and uh, I'm not sure whether the aiming we sent was actually active. Uh, yeah, it, it wasn't showing very uh, gr uh, promising potential in the SPR, but that, that that could could be my my end of error, uh, mm. my end of mistake. So I'm in progress of making remaking this as well. So this is what I tested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it didn't get any. Uh, it didn't get the IC fifties because the amount we sent was very limited. Uh, didn't got enough amount to test the whole biological assay mm -hmm. yeah okay. all right but it's great you've assembled this because it, it highlights what we what we still need to get and you know in terms of the work that we've all put into this series i think it's very important we do get a publication out of it and completion of this table will ensure that yeah yeah sure absolutely if you want more mic just send everything together because um we can run multiple compounds at the same time for mic yeah right Great. Wow, that'd be perfect. Thanks. So yeah, if you want to fill up more stuff on the list, then on mm -hmm. the table. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks. And my assumption was that we we could use um uh Helen Zagatskaya at Oklahoma for a uh, yeah. assays. But there is also someone in the UK who runs those assays at Manchester, I think, and I forget who that is. Um I can look it up, but but if anyone has a secret way into an accumulation assay, maybe in the UK, that we could use to test that, that would be great because that might make you it. You mean accumulation inside the bacteria? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah uh, yesterday um, I was at Crick and this professor, uh, she's doing uh, efflux res uh, research. I'm not sure whether she would be able to reach out yeah please make contact if you can uh she's in uk birmingham i'm not sure birmingham yeah might be the same person okay but maybe forward me the uh, details and we can look at it all right yeah but Thanks. if anyone has, has, has an idea it'd be, it'd be great to try and do some measurements here so even if we don't see an mic with these compounds it would be great to check somehow independently that they are accumulating better because we've added the guanatinium yeah yeah so that's kind a... of the idea there is a rapid fire MS uh, essay done by GSK to measure that. Mm. Um, that I was trying to look into, and yeah, I haven't found a person yet, but I wanted it to be a UK lab. Yeah, run it. Uh, so I could just go back to it and see if I get any anything useful that we could look into. Yeah, I mean, it has to be the usual academic deal that there's no money. Yeah, there. exactly. No Co-authorship, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks, Yuhan. Great. Yeah, thanks. I just oh, or just one thing worth mentioning because uh, from the original paper, the Hergo Rosa published uh, uh, to 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 add the quantitative feature to the structure, 
uh, the potency was expected to drop. <laughs> so, so that's why we are uh, testing accumulation for the benefit of uh, uh, giving a reason of why we're making this. Okay. Uh, otherwise, they, they they probably won't say, "Hey, why you're making this?" If it, if the potency is so shit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Um. So, uh, other than that, Laura, did you want to add anything about what's been going on? Any updates you wanted to share? Uh. Well, the same with the structures. Anything I get is is just no. Um. I cannot find any ligands, or they're in the wrong location, like in crystallization contact pockets. Like I see the, I think the SSGCAD found. Um, they got a structure, but they were in crystal contact pockets. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, same story as every time. It's still trying though. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Um. There are new. There will probably be new experiments set up in the next week, and then see if we can do at least two or three uh, shipments for the next round in diamond. Okay. Yeah. I usually try to do two or three every time they open. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're trying to work with Diamond at the moment, but there's a big, big shutdown at the moment, right? Yeah, they just shut down every three, four weeks. Depends on the time of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So uh, I wonder if there was any updates from Laurie and Sam and team from chemistry. Did you want to update us on the stuff you've been doing? Uh, yeah. So we've got you got uh two undergrads with us today so tommy or thomas as he is on zoom um tommy's been working on the project for about six months um oh, is it about six months or is it less than that i can't actually yeah it's been about six months i've been working part-time i'm an undergraduate but yeah yeah welcome um so tommy's gonna give a quick update and then cole who's also joined for the first time he uh cole's gonna be starting on the chemistry and he's here for about two months or so full-time i believe so, um, but yeah, so Tommy, take it away. All right, cool. Hi everyone, uh, nice to meet you. Like Sam said, I'm Tommy. I've been working on the project for about six months and so I'm just gonna have an update on um, the synthetic efforts from our end. I've been doing most of the chemistry under Sam's um, supervision. So, all right, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, um, so the two hits on the left are what we've been basing the contents I've been making off of. And then our general scaffold you can see on the right. I've mainly been focusing on derivatizations in that R1 region that are hopefully po probing the binding pocket. Um, and then I've tried it as well, two different scaffolds in that R3 section. Um, and then here's some of the folks that have been working on the project. So here we go. Um, oh wait, I missed a slide. Yeah, so here's our general synthetic route. Uh, the first step is a cyclization with chloroacetyl nitrile, and then the second step is a substitution of that chlorine um, to create a variety of um, primarily amine derivatives, but then also a thiol we've tried. Um, and then these three compounds at the bottom are the compounds that we've shipped so far. So you can see there's been uh, three different scaffolds we've tried. There's a, on the far right, uh, a dimethyl on the far left of the molecule, and then as, as well as a cyclohexyl and then an N-methyl derivative. Um, so these are the compounds that have been shipped, and then I'm gonna explain the compounds that I've been working on um, that are in progress. So here's just a general chart of all the things I've tried. Um, as you can see, I've focused on two different scaffolds that are at the top of these charts. Um, I've been primarily focusing on the one with the cyclohexyl on the far left of the molecule, um, just because there's been uh, a lot of solubility problems with the one on the right. And it was very hard to track. The reactions are very hard to track on TLC and LCMS. Um, and so I've been primarily focusing on the uh, cyclohexyl scaffold. Um, so these compounds that are highlighted in green um, are ones that are finished and ready to go. So there's uh, an aniline derivative, uh, there's an amino alcohol, and then there's an aniline derivative for the uh, N-methyl scaffold as well. Um, so hopefully, We'll send those out. I know one of these has been sent already, and then two of them will be sent out the next time we ship compounds. Um, so hopefully we can get some cool data for those. And then these ones highlighted in red are ones that 
are currently paused. Um, like I said, there's been a variety of, of challenges with these compounds, namely just poor physio physiochemical properties. Um, and, you know, this has been a learning experience for me as well, because like Sam said, I'm an undergrad. So I'm not saying that the synthesis, synthesis of this is impossible, but there's been a lot of challenges um, with the solubility and with just tracking the reactions. So these ones are ones that are currently um, been paused either because of issues with purification or just because I wasn't seeing the correct product being formed. Um, and then these ones in yellow are ones that I'm currently working on and hoping to finish up before I my time in the lab is done. Um, so yeah, there's a uh, bromoaniline and then there's a few different ones. Um, most of these are amine derivatives and then there's a thiol derivative as well. And um, yeah, it's, it's pr primarily just a, a challenge of purifying these compounds. I've made all four of them, um, but the purification has been pretty difficult just because some of them are very polar and refuse to separate by both normal and reverse phase columns. Um, and then other ones have the opposite problem where they're pretty apolar and then normal phase columns can separate them very well. But I'm hopeful I can get at least two of these and hopefully three of them done. Maybe the fourth, although that file derivative is uh, super difficult to work with just because it's not soluble in basically any solvent that I've tried. Um, but hopefully I'll get at least three more compounds out of this and we'll have about five to ship for the next round of uh, shipping. So, yep. Sounds great. Um, any, anyone want to add to that? So, so Cole, are you taking over this chemistry if, if Tommy's finishing up? Is that the, is that what's going on right now? I've started working on my own stuff, but uh, this is now my second week in the lab, so I haven't done too much yet. Yeah, finding your feet. Yeah. The okay. idea is that um, that Carl will indeed take over a little bit from what Tommy's been doing mm -hmm. and look to kind of, we've got obviously cyclohexyl, dimethyl, and methylamine cores on the on the structure. So we're going to try and make sure we've got matched pairs across all of the, those so we can um, investigate. FAR. And we'll see maybe when we get some results, we can look at where, which direction we want to go in. Great. And you are, just remind me, sorry, what's the, where, where are you primarily shipping these? What's the, the first destination? Uh, we're shipping them so to Warwick. Warwick. Yeah. Warwick. Warwick yeah. and AstraZeneca for admin properties. Great. Um, and actually, and then, yeah, I was meant to uh, put a new issue online with the summary, so I forgot to do that. I will get that done. <laughs> okay, great. I, I thought they were being tested against something else at the same time there, right? Is that the AZ testing? Mm, there's nothing else that they're tested against, okay. aside from ADME. All right, great. Looks good. Yeah, can be real challenging to purify things when you've got those kind of those kind of challenges. So good luck. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, all right, that's really useful. Um, anybody else want to add anything to anything? You know, if we haven't touched on something important. Um, we did submit the CC four carb proposal finally. Um, so Yuhang did a great job of all the graphics and we got, you know, loads of inputs from Joe and it's it's gone in and we're hoping that in a few days that will be, get looked at by the board. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what they say. We've asked for some help with the chemistry in exploring those new derivatives that we proposed. So we'll let you know if we hear anything. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it'd be useful to get some chemistry. Um, and obviously, you know, we want to try and, generate some money to help support the stuff that's going on in Warwick and 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 try and get this this project properly funded. So as always, you know, the early data that we're talking about here in an ideal world, we find something that is sufficiently promising that we can justify getting a grant. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's all I have. Um, so unless anyone else has anything else, that's been very helpful. We'll post the recording online and we will be catching up again next month. That's good. Thank okay. you, everyone.
Thanks, Thanks for coming so along, much, everybody. Everyone. See you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye.